Good morning, everybody. It is a real pleasure to come here and to just open God's Word together with you. Uh, So as many of you know, we have been in the series of Nehemiah, uh, just observing together what God has done through the people of Israel, bringing them back to Jerusalem and everything that followed through that. I'm just going to address the elephant in the room right now. A lot of you are like, you're not Pastor Chris. Yes, that is true. Um, we, Pastor Chris had a really great opportunity just to spend some really good quality time with his family. So we want to be supportive of him as a church and allow them to do that and have that awesome family time. So we pray for them to just enjoy the rest of their time together. But in the meantime, before I get into the passage, um, I want to just say a quick reminder of what, we were ta- what we've been talking about in the last couple weeks um, has been mostly with... Nehemiah, bringing all the people back, bringing all the people back into Jerusalem, and now they have gone, they've been all this time of confessing their sins, confessing their wronggoings, confessing the fact that they have wandered from God, but they are now brought back to God, and everything then follows from that. All right? So before we go into this, we are ending into this time of what we would call the big word we're going to be talking about today is devotion. The people are now rededicating themselves as a people now that they've all returned, now that they have had a time of confession of their sins and their way we're going, now they want to repurpose themselves and rededicate themselves as a people to following God. What that looks like is simply this. I wanna, before we go into that, I want to tell a quick story. When I was in high school, I was actually a runner. <laughs> and some of you are like, you, are you a glutton for punishment? Apparently I was. But in high school, I ran cross country, I ran winter track, and I ran spring track. And during that time, I was, when I was a freshman, I was just kind of learning how to do it, how to do this whole running thing, how to go about it. Um, and in the meantime, I met this guy named Jeremy. And Jeremy was a junior at this time, and he was another Christian guy that I had just met, and a great guy. Just one of those kind of people that was just nice to everybody. Everybody really cared about him. He was a captain um, very early on, elected a captain early on just because of his character. And one thing I learned about this guy is that he dedicated himself a long time ago to making sure that he carried himself in a godly way. And when he did that, everybody could tell. A couple different instances with this. We had one guy who was a guy's, guy's team captain who was like top, top of the, our top runner basically. And he was just like, you know, he was a nice guy, but kind of relied on his talent. And then you have Jeremy who, he was never varsity. He was just, he was JV the entire time. But we all kind of ran together and practiced together. And just the way he just cared for people, he'd be the guy that would kind of like, if you were hurt, he'd kind of carry you up somewhere. If he would be lifting giant buckets of water all the way up a huge hill to our practice field to make sure everybody had water, that's the kind of guy he was. What really impressed me about Jeremy was this. There was one cross-country meet where it was really hard running. If any, any runners in here? I know there's some. Okay, great. So when it's, for some of us, some of us runners, when it's like really when it's really wet out, it's really damp and the air is heavy. Some people like that, but some people, your lungs kind of respond in a very negative way. Where there's too much moisture in the air, your lungs kind of like clench a little bit. What happened was is a lot of people were having a lot of trouble breathing, a lot of trouble like, you know, just running and keeping their pace. Well, anyway, I had gone through, I'd finished my race, I'd turn around and Jeremy, I could see Jeremy coming through finishing his race. And a lot of you, if you've ever seen a race, that last like quarter mile, even like 100 yards, is like what they, you put in what's called your kick. Where it's like that, every last bit of energy you have, you're just throwing everything at it. You could be getting this tunnel vision of that finish line and you just want to get done. (laughs) You've been running for three miles, I'm done. Get this over as quickly as possible. And that's how most people are. Not Jeremy. I was like, I would have passed him. You know, I was, a, I was a freshman though, so, you know, nah, I, I, yeah, he, he was just a better guy than me. But I'll never forget that. And then, of course, I go over to congratulate some of the other guys, and I'm seeing him going, <gasps> and then when he gets his breath, he goes to the other guy and says, great race. Hey, you did a great job. You did a great job. And I'm like, man, did they make you in a factory or something? <laughs> you know? But, that, but he was the kind of guy who purposed his life 
and dedicated his life to be an example and encouragement and a light to those around him. So right before we enter the scriptures, what I'd like to do is lead us in a quick word of prayer to center our minds, center our hearts, and make sure that we are really ready to interact with God's word today. So let's pray together really quick. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. God, I just pray that as we enter into this time of reading, this time of intentionality, God, I pray that you would help us just to alleviate all the distractions that we have today and that we would center ourselves, center our hearts, and center our minds on your truth and your love today. I pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So what we're entering with to right now is going to Jeremiah, Nehemiah 10. I don't want you to go into the wrong chapter here. That'd be really bad. The big idea we want to go for today is that our life's passion will determine the purpose of our life and the person we become. I'm going to read that to you. Interact with that one more time. Our life's passion will determine the purpose of our life and the person that we become. As we interact with that, I kind of want to just say how we're going to unfold this next few chapters. By the way, I just want to say a quick disclaimer here. We are going to be interacting with three chapters of Scripture this morning in less than 30 minutes. So I'm going to ask for a little grace on this. There are going to be some points we kind of have to speed up, and then some points we'll kind of slow down. Consider it like a family road trip, okay? We're going on a bit of a family road trip through Nehemiah 10 to 12. There will be times to, you know, drop a gear and speed up, and there'll be times where we can slow down and say, okay, let's inter- interact with this because there's a big lesson coming up in this whole big picture that we have that is Nehemiah 10 to 12. So let's just keep that in mind, and we'll go through with this. As we interact with these certain truths, I wanted you to see up here on the boards really quick, we'll be talking about, in terms of dedication and dedicating your life to something. In this instance, Israelites dedicating themselves, rededicating themselves to Christ. There's three different areas that we talk about, and that is with the person, which is who I'll be, the purpose, or our purpose, which is what I'm here to do, and then your passion. Your passion is, who am I going to worship? And sometimes it's what I'll worship. And as we said in our statement before, your passion is what determines those other two things, your purpose and your person, who, what kind of person you will be. So let's explore that for a second. We go into Nehemiah 10, if you have your Bibles open with me. We're going to jump back one verse, and we're going to actually start in chapter 9, verse 38. So Nehemiah 9, verse 38, we sit here and say, because of all this, meaning all the interacting they've done and confessing of their sins and this great amount of, like, of sin that they're admitting to God they've done, because of this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And what I want you to do right now is as we look in Scripture, verse 10, what this is going to be is it's going to be a long list of all these names, if you take your eyes really quick and you just scan down this list of all these names, these are people who were the first to put their name and their sealing on this is how we will determine and promise and commit to be this kind of people, and we'll put our names on it. Consider it like the same as like the Declaration of Independence and those those people that signed it, like their names, basically they're committing treason. To, to sign this Declaration of Independence against the King of England, these, these people are sitting here saying, we are committing to following this law and to be these kind of people, and we will set this example and be these leaders in this. We are determining and devoting our lives and who we are to being this. That's, those are these names that we're interacting with right now. But as we scale down here a little bit, I want to go down to verse 28. And it says this, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands of the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. 
So they, in a way, that's like what we call an introductory purpose statement. We are committing ourselves. We join our brothers, we will walk in God's law, and we will observe and do all of his commandments. We are saying we're not just going to be the kind of people that know it. We're not going to be the kind of people that read it. We want to be the kind of people that do it. We want to follow it. And as they recommit themselves, they understand they can't just say it. They have to lay it out. We have to sit here and say, okay, what are the details? What are the specifics? Well, when you interact with verses 30, all the way down a little further, from verse 30 down, down actually over to 39, they outline a few things for us. All these things they talk about are basically as follows. They're making a solemn commitment to follow God's law. They want to maintain temple worship. All that time that they had spent rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, they're gonna maintain that and separate themselves from pagan practices. And there's a reason why that's important is because for so many years, they all lived in exile. They're all separated and spread out and living amongst pagan nations and, let's be honest, picking up a lot of bad habits. And sometimes we spend all this time blending in, in wrong ideology and submersing ourselves in wrong things. We pick up those habits. And we're creatures of habit. And sometimes to break a habit, it takes some extreme measures. And that's what they're taking. So all these things that they're talking about, for example, just give you, they're committing not to intermarry with godless nations. So meaning they're not going to allow their sons and daughters to marry other people from other people groups that do not worship God. Because they are not just committing themselves to following God, they want to commit their families. They want to commit their future generations. They want their households to love and worship the Lord Almighty. They want to be a, a recommitted people, not just person. They willingly submit themselves to be led by God because they remembered who he is. They remembered that he is God Almighty, that he is perfect, he is loving. He is the same God that created the universe, that put all the stars in place, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that lifted mountains, tore down kings, built up people groups, the same God who brings lightning but also brings crops, the same God who puts the sun in the sky. But this, and yet the same God who, if nothing else, trades all of that just for a relationship with you, just to love you, just to love me. That's the God he is. And we remember that. It makes committing to him a little easier, doesn't it? And when we forget that, it makes it easier to walk away. So some other things they committed to in that passage we just described, they do no business on the Sabbath, they, commit, they lay out and give details to the giving that they would give to the Lord. Also burnt offerings, not neglecting the temple. All the way down, if you see to, we're gonna go over to verse 39 where it says, and the very last thing, we will not neglect the house of our God. Meaning taking care of that, you know, being grateful for what he's given us and also worshiping him wholeheartedly. This covenant was a declaration of their desire to be God's holy people once again and a theme that was emphasized through Nehemiah's reforms. And then, here's where it gets a little tricky. I know we did a little skipping already, but again, this is where we have to have a little understanding. This is a long list coming up of a lot of names. Now, I want to make, make something very, very clear. Every word in Scripture is important. Every word written down has its value. However, every, every word in Scripture also has different applications. These names that we see here listed here, every, word, every name has a story. Every name is a people group. And these names are great for historical reference, uh, proofing, family lines, um, timelines. All those other things, they serve a great purpose in that. And I want to be sure that uh, what we encourage you all to do as a family and worshipers of Jesus Christ is not let this be the only time that we interact with God's word. Don't let this be the only time you interact with this. I encourage you strongly to take the time to look through Nehemiah 10 to 12 on your own sometime this week because there's a lot in here 
and, we, and unfortunately, we only have so much time to go over it, but just bear with me, and we will get through there. This is another time where dad has to like drop the gear and speed up a little bit through the family drive, you know what I mean? So in Nehemiah 11, and actually it goes all the way from Nehemiah 11, almost halfway through Nehemiah 12, where it says, the people, these people living in Jerusalem, I'm gonna read the first four verses. Nehemiah 11, verse one. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring out one out of every 10 to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of the 10 remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. And these are the chiefs of the province who lived in Jerusalem. But in the towns of Judah, everyone lived in his own property in their towns. Israel, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and the descendants of Solomon's servants. And in Jerusalem lived lived certain of the sons of Judah and the sons of Benjamin. So this is what Nehemiah is saying. He's saying, we cast lots to see basically 10% of people will live within the city and everyone else will live in the villages around. But in the end of the day, we are centering ourselves around Jerusalem. This is where we'll gather. We are committing ourselves to our chapter 11 and about halfway through 12 saying we are purposing ourselves. We are repurposing ourselves to be situated as God's people once again. So it goes through, we see again in about, you know, chapter 11, verse 4b, we have all these names. And as we scan through, there's so many names and so many people, like different people with, uh, with Levites, with leaders, with priests. Um, if you look through here, we're estimating over 3,000 people when you see their family counts that are also listed in there and all these other jobs and descriptions that are going through here. We have so many people that are just so willing and so committed to be the original people that God intended them to be. So in chapter 10, we have people committing and saying, these are the kind of people we will be, saying this is how we're going to live our lives. We are going to commit to being the kind of people who not just know God's law, understand God's law, but we want to live it and do it. Now in chapter 11, we're seeing where they're saying, okay, we are purposing ourselves and putting ourselves in a position, even, even physically, to be God's chosen people once again. They are recommitting to be a people who worship and glorify God with their lives. They want to rebuild a God-serving nation. They want to go back to the original purpose and intent of what God purposed them to be. Does it feel like that in our own lives sometimes? That there are times where we get so distracted by the day-to-day, the work-a-day, the things that we gotta do, all the other demands on our time, all the things that pull us away from certain things, where we feel like we've almost lost our purpose. Or at least not our purpose, but we've, our own purpose, like in our understanding of it, has gone a little muddled. It's gotten a little cloudy. And we begin to ask ourselves, is this really Is this really what my life is about? Is this really what I'm here to do? Is this really all there is to life? And it's not, I will will encourage us all here, myself included, it has nothing to do with the day-to-day of life and the rigors and the up and downs of it. It has everything to do with the amazing purpose and vision and beauty that God has laid before each and every one of us to live a life that is purposeful and pleasing to him. And you know what? We get blessings from that. This isn't a God who just says, follow me because. Follow me because I said so. Follow me because I'm great, you're not, that's it. He gives us purpose. He gives us life. He gives us life eternal, and we get to be the recipients of that. They want to be who God intended them to be, a people set apart as a light and salt of the earth, and standing for God's truth. This was a lot of work that went into this, so we don't want to mitigate that. They had had been a people who were everywhere, and now they're coming together and saying, no, we are determining to center ourselves on Jesus Christ. So finally, we've talked about two things. We have talked about, I know it's been a bit of a fast forward, and some of you are like, wow, okay, that's 10 and 11. 10, 
we will be people who determine to follow God's law. Chapter 11, we want to follow God's purpose for our lives because you know what? Mine's not really working out the way I thought it would all the time. A lot of times I try to do it myself. It doesn't go well. And then we come to chapter 12. And this is where it all kind of comes together. What we have here in chapter 12, after we list all the people, we list all the people that have been selected to live within the city, and then all the people groups that have now been selected to live outside their villages. That goes all the way until chapter 12. If we go down to verse 26 is where it's listed. What I'd like to do with you, if you can, we're going to pick it up in verse 27. And this is what we're going to read. At this point, people have been settled, people have been placed in their villages. Now it's time to celebrate. Now it's time to give credit where credit is due. Now it's time to have our passions and our hearts turn towards the one who really made this all happen, who it's really all about, who really is worthy of us getting excited about. And this is what it says. They're about to rededicate their wall, the wall in their city and their people to them in a ceremonial way. And it says, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Natophathites, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba, and Asmaveth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people, and the gates, and the wall. And then I, Nehemiah, brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall, and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. And two great choirs also, and if you have another version, it could also say processions, like parades. One went to the south in the wall to the dung gate, and after them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshalem, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets, Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zakur, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Melali, Galilee, Mai, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. At the fountain gate, they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David at the ascent of the wall above the house of David and to the water gate on the east. The other choir, or procession, for those who gave thanks, went to the north, and I followed them with half the people on the wall and above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall and above the gate of Ephraim and by the gate of Yeshana and by the fish gate and the tower of Hananel and the tower of the hundred to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God and I and half of the officials with me. And the priests of Eliakim, Maaseah, and Miniamin, Micaiah, Elioni, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Maaseah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzai, Jehohanan, Malgijah. They start to blend after a little while. I'm just telling you, when you read publicly, this is how it goes. <laughs> Elam and Ezar, and the singers sang with Jezrahiah, as their leader. And here's, the, and here's the verse I want us all to settle on. So at this point, if we've been driving for a while together, as, us as a family through this, this is where we're going to park for a minute. Verse 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Where is the anchoring? Where is the 
base and the beginning and the source of that joy, it says right there, God is the one that gave them that great joy. We had a dedication, we had certain processions. Here's what I want you to kind of understand. I have a diagram that's gonna go up here really quick of a very, very basic look of the Wall of Jerusalem. I don't know if any of you, some of you probably can't read it. Some of you in the back are probably going like this, like I would right now. But basically what we're talking about is all the way down at the bottom is what we see is what's known as the dung gate. Because that was the gate they'd go out to to throw away trash and waste, right? And so the processions, as many are pointing from this, starting at the south ends of the city, one procession going up through the valley gate to the old gate, fish gate, and to the sheep gate while the second procession went to the right of the fountain gate and towards the water gate. They basically go around the city, praising and celebrating. You have to imagine thousands of people lining this wall. Instruments, singers, celebration, cheers, and, and just worship going on along these walls. It is a massive, massive undertaking because they want to make clear to themselves, they want to make clear to everyone there, and not just that, in verse 43 it says, the joy could be heard from where? Far away. They want everyone around them to know, this is why we live, this is why we celebrate, this is who we follow, and this is who I follow with my heart. I follow Jesus Christ, and God gets all the glory. And they finish all that by going up, and that little dot inside is where about the temple area was, and they all end there, and they praise the Lord. And they dedicate, they rededicate their entire being of them as a people back to God. Worship is what we give our time, energy, and affection to. We all worship something. These people clearly wanted to make a point in positioning themselves to worship God in a physical way, an emotional way, in every way they could. They worship God in their person by saying, God, I'm gonna commit to not just being a hearer or a study of your word, I want to do your word. I want to do your will. They also want to commit their purpose, saying, God, I understand that I'm here to love you, not, be, not just because you're God, but because I love you, because you loved me so much, that you sacrificed so much for me so that I could gain all the benefit. I understand that immense gift, and I want to live for that. Now what we get to see is their passion. We've seen their purpose and their person, and the passion is what drives it. When you find yourself so in love with Jesus Christ that you can't imagine doing anything else but living for him, that's when you begin to understand. And is that an easy mindset to always fall into and remember? No, it's not. Because we get it wrong a lot, do we not? There's a lot of things that pull our attention away, and that's what Israel went through. They understand. We're e it's easy to wander. It's easy to just let those distractions in, to let those things take up the space in our heart that God intended for him, for his relationship with us. In 1 Corinthians 13, it actually gives us a warning. So actually, if I, if I could do this really quick, I'm gonna make the slides people really mad. Uh, the, three, the three words that we have for this in the very beginning of this slide where it says person, pur purpose, and passion, if I could pull up really quick. We can look at this very objectively and say, okay, God, we're seeing here that you want my person and my purpose and my heart, my passion. Notice that passion is the very foundation of what we're working with here. In 1 Corinthians, it says, if I speak with the language of, a thou of, of all the angels, and I have not love, I'm a noisy gong. If I speak with prophecy and knowledge, and I have all the faith in the world to move mountains, and I speak and it moves, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. 
And if I, if I have nothing or if I give everything I have to the poor, but I don't have love, I am nothing. Look at this with me really quick. I could be a kind of person who says, God, you know what? I'm going to understand your law. I'm going to memorize verses. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to make sure I obey all the rules and be a really good person. But if my heart's not in it, my love for him, my understanding of him as my savior is not in it, it's, it's meaningless. I could even sit here and say, okay, God, well, I'm gonna give you my purpose. Like, I'm gonna purpose myself to make sure that I'm, you know, that I'm like, I'm going to church every Sunday. I'm joining a small group. That I'm making sure that everyone else around me is also following along and doing what I'm telling them to do to follow Jesus and, you know, do all the commandments, keep all the laws and stuff and make sure we're on the straight and narrow. But if I don't have love, if my passion is not there, It's for nothing. It is meaningless because we've missed the point. We've made it about us. We've made it about I'm following a rule or I'm following a plan. I'm looking like a good follower. I can make myself look like I got it all together. But a heart that's truly broken, a heart that truly sees like the Israelites did had to look back in Nehemiah 9 where it says, God, I'm a mess. God, I'm a sinner. God, above all that, I need you. God, help me with that. God, I need, and and if we're sitting here saying, Pastor Kenny, I want that kind of love. I want to be able, like, I, I agree with what you're saying here. I know my passion has to drive everything, but I'm having trouble finding it. That's okay. Tell God that. Be honest with him. Say, God, help me love you more. One of the best marriage advices I ever got was when someone just simply told me, hey, like sometimes you just gotta look at your wife and say, how can I love you right now? What's the best way I can love you? And that allows me to see, to put my brain down, because I'm a chronic overthinker, and then I get to hear from her heart, isn't that all God wants? Sometimes it just takes us saying to stop making about us, making us look like we've got it all together, like we can follow all the rules, we can do all the stuff, but actually do the work that says, God, I'm gonna give you my heart. I'm gonna let my passion drive me. God, I wanna love you with everything I have. Because here's the thing, we have a tendency to wander, we have a tendency to want to follow other things. And really quickly, before, before I end here, as I land this, in James 4, it says this. I just wanna read this to you really quick. James 4, 4 through 10, it says simply, this is gonna come out very direct. So I'm gonna pre-warn you here. This is just to address people in our own hearts, how we wander sometimes. It says, you adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And then in verse 10, it even says, humble yourselves before God. He will exalt you. Here's my encouragement to all of us right now. The first reminder of this whole thing is that our life's passion, again, will determine the purpose of our life and the person we become. So what is God calling you to rededicate in your heart today? What is God calling you to say, God, I've been, I've been giving you a lot of my behaviors. God, I, you know what, I've been giving you like my, my outward actions. I've been giving you, like, trying to make myself, like, all dressed up and looking pretty good in front of everybody else. But I could be honest, my heart's not always there. God, I've been giving you, like, this outward being of, like, I've, like I'm purposing my life. I'm keeping everyone else around me on the straight and narrow. I'm trying to keep everybody else accountable and everything. 
but in a way I've neglected my own heart, my own spirit, my own walk. God, I've been adulterous. Hard to say. God, I've let all these other things drive me. I've let all these other things in life give me purpose and affect my person. But God, I don't want my passion to go anywhere else other than to you. I don't want to be driven by other people's opinions of me. I don't want to be driven by outward looking success. I don't want to be driven by how my family makes me look. I don't want to be driven by the amount of money in my bank account. I don't want to be driven by anything else in this world other than the fact of your incredible love that you gave everything for me so that I can live for you and show your love to everybody. So what in your heart do you have to rededicate? As the men, as everybody, people come forward to help with communion, I just want us to think about that. As we, as we meditate on this time together and we say, God, what do I need to give over to you? What, do, what, what in my heart am I wrestling with, am I stirring with and fighting with that makes me want to wander, makes me prone to do all that? It's hard. It's, it's not easy work to do. In fact, God's, God doesn't, God hits it on the nose sometimes where he says it's not an easy thing. It's a struggle. But if we're struggling, that's Okay because it at least means we're fighting forward, we're moving forward toward him, and we're not just submitting. You know, and John, John simply says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no fellowship with me. And that confused a lot of people. But, but family, we wanna make sure that we are the kind of people that when we look at this example from Nehemiah, when we come out of this discussion with Nehemiah 10 to 12, what I want us all to remember is that it's never too late and there's never an opportunity we can't rededicate our lives and our hearts back to the God who loves us. He doesn't get sick of us. He doesn't get tired of us. He doesn't grow frustrated. He waits. He's the God that waits with open arms, ready to pick us up again and walk with us as we pursue him again with our person, our purpose in life, and our passion of our hearts. So as we enter into this time right now, we wanna be reminded that this time is something that was set aside long ago by Jesus Christ where he said, as I said earlier, to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood is to have fellowship with me. There's two cups, one bread, one juice, but there's nothing magic about this. There's nothing that is, by eating this bread to people, that doesn't do anything. It's about re- remembering what Jesus did so that we can live for him, so that we can get our hearts right, we get our minds right in all of this. But there is a warning. In 1 Corinthians 11, it does say to not partake of this if there's any if there's any sin in your life that is unconfessed, if there's any work you have to do with God now, if there's something that you have to rededicate in your heart right now, don't miss the opportunity. God is always waiting, eagerly waiting for us. So what I'd like to do right now is give us all an opportunity right now in our silence and just pray. Examine our hearts before we move forward. If there's anything in our lives that we can rededicate and give back to God in our person, let's do that now. Lord God, we commit this time to you in our hearts. Lord, I pray that as we self-examine ourselves, Lord, help us to be honest with ourselves. 
Help us here and now to take a page out of this lesson from the book of Nehemiah. We can examine ourselves clearly and say, God, I've let other things in that don't belong there. God, I want to dedicate my entire being to loving you and following you, not because it's what I expected, not because of what I should do, but it's because I see you for who you are, a loving savior who gave himself for me and loves me and wants the absolute best for my life. Lord, help us all to submit to that as we enter this time of communion. I pray all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. how he loves you and me. It's a hard thing to remind ourselves sometimes, but let's be a people who commit ourselves to remembering because when you remember, remember the true purpose of why we're here, but also the true person of Jesus Christ and how much he gave because of his immense love for us the future becomes a lot more clear. The next steps become a lot more clear. All the future decisions become a lot more clear. So as we remember, it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 
it says, and the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. And after supper, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, after our time of reflection and praying and committing ourselves to remembering through communion, we also be reminded of ways that we as a people also love those and reach out to others here. And once a month, we remind ourselves of the deacon fund that we have. It's funding that we use as a church to love those within our congregation who are hurting, who are struggling and have needs. So if you are able to and you would like to give specifically to the deacon fund, you have boxes out there you can give to, or you can also make that designation in a check or even online giving for our deacon's fund so that we can show love even to our family here. And what I'd like to do is as we sell our time, we'll pray and the worship team will come up and we will finish out our service of worship. Lord God, it's hard sometimes to remember in the midst of stressors and struggles and hard times in life, but God, if we are really honest with ourselves, those are the times we should come to you the quickest. God, we're, we're all prone to wander. We're all like sheep who go astray, but God, you are the good shepherd who would leave the 99 just for the one. God, you are so loving and caring and ever-present, and God, when we forget that, when we forget that is when we wander, but God, Thank you that you welcome us back and bring us back with open arms as a loving and caring father. God, help us as we go about this week. Challenge us to keep interacting with your word and the reminders from Nehemiah. Help us be a people who determine to love you and continually dedicate our heart, mind, body, and spirit to being a people who love you with our lives and with the passion of our hearts. We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen.